So we are in session 26 and we will look into a very, very, very old features called COM and we'll see some of the XML overview again, continue with XML stuff and get into the COM and uh, RCW, which is, we'll see. So this session includes uh, validating an XML using uh, XSD programmatically and also exercise uh, will demonstrate a code uh, to develop a searchable data form using link. We did develop a search form uh, in the previous session with populating the data. We can transform that into a searchable grid uh, using the link on top of it. Okay, we'll see that exercise. And also we'll look into the component object model which is uh, COM and uh, how can we use it inside .NET. And also we'll see an overview of COM plus, what's the difference between COM and COM plus and uh, the DCOM, distributable COM, we'll see what is that on our view and creating a COM component in, uh, using the VB 6.0. We create an ActiveX component uh, inside VB 6.0 and consuming that component inside a dot and application using RCW which stands for Runtime Callable Wrappers. Okay, so let's kick off and look into the COM in this session. The programmatic XSD validation, uh, just to recap again, and we did uh, uh, do the XSD validation in the uh, project itself, uh, in the Visual Studio itself, and let me take rid of this browser. Okay, let me close all these. Doing this, perfect. So here we have a clean uh, ID right now. I just closed everything else. So we did see the XML and XSD validation um, when we have an XML file like this. So I just added up um, an XML NS, uh, which is again required for, uh, so, so this was uh, not there before, if you remember. So, and so for automatic XSD validation using programmatic way, I was telling that XML NS will come into play and this is when I just added an XML NS namespace the name, ideally speaking, uh, the XML NS is a namespace that uh, you can make your respective uh, objects in the XML uh, unique. So in the real world uh, example, it will normally, you will have an XML NS for each and every attribute so that if you want to apply a kind of uh, uh, rules uh, using the XSD specific to the given XML uh, uh, namespace, that's when it, this makes a very big role. And in this case, I did exactly the same thing. So uh, I added an XML NS here and also within the XSD, of course, soon after I generate an XSD. So we'll create one XSD again from out of fly here, create an XSD. And the XSD ha will carry forward the target namespace. Okay, if you see this, this is the target namespace. It, it uh, carries along with it. And this need to be uh, in place, so what the XSD does is it's going to look up for this given target namespace inside your XML file and then apply the validations that we already have here. In other words, the document definition that we have in the XSD file. And uh, it, the same thing goes like this and if at all uh, we need to target this uh, file with respect to since I have just generated this um, file, uh, XML file, so it's already marked there and if you see the target namespace is already given here, it's taken up there. And uh, since I applied this automatically, so it's the same thing will uh, apply if I change the definition ID N and uh, I should see the validation uh, implicitly being done. It says ID N attribute is not declared. Okay, and what will happen if I change my um, XML NS? Let's take a look at this. So if you take a look at this, soon after I change my XML NS uh, with the wrong name, it doesn't, it no more applies the respective validation on this file. Although the XSD is already attached to the XML file. Okay, so that the so the the namespace may plays a major role uh, in having the XML 
uh, and the HST for validation. So that's one key thing I wanted to cover and also we'll jump into the programmatic uh, validation. So what, what it takes uh, to programmatically do the same thing because of course the uh, ideal scenario for programmatic validation is in the in the case of uh, an XML feed coming into your application say for example um, the integration points from your application to another uh, uh, application for example uh, uh, if the data is captured by a major system like a mainframe system in general uh, which captures the information and the same information is used by the reporting servers so if you the data normally the data need to be integrated across uh, various data databases ideal scenarios the OLTP and OLAP uh, is a two different types of databases normally we in general so OLTP is the online transaction database which usually will be a highly normalized data store because it is a highly transactional driven database model and whereas when it comes to OLAP, it becomes a more denormalized data store, uh, which will consume, which will have only uh, the set of data which is required for the reporting. Um, so which will be completely denormalized data, so that uh, the uh, analysis engines can run much faster than um, the kind of queries that you can apply on OLTP. Although the data is same, but the database, uh, the, how the database is designed is completely different from OLTP and OLAP. So when the, once the ins information is captured in OLTP uh, database, that data is, is fed to the uh, other databases, which is OLAP databases. So how it is fed is uh, the usual best uh, or simplest way normally happens is using an XML file or a CSV file, the file based feeds driven. So which is, in which case this is the most common thing that uh, if you ever get into any project you will definitely people will ask you how do you uh, consume a CSV file or an XML file feed coming into the system and how can you integrate into your uh, application. So this is this is the ex exact uh, example we are having in this case uh, when we have an XML file uh, came into your system. It's, as we know, XML file is just a uh, UTF-8 encoded file, which is a plain text file. So, uh, we, how do we guarantee that the file that came into your system is valid or not? So, of course, we did talk about um, a well-formed XML versus a valid XML, right? So, in this case, although it's a well-formed, we need to make sure that it's a well, it's a valid XML. So programmatically, we should be able to do validate that file and see if it is valid and then move on to the next uh, action item which is uh, loading the data into the respective database. Okay, so the first step we are doing here is the uh, validating. So how do we do validate um, for the given XML against a given XSD? So that's what uh, the demo we're going to do now. Okay. So we'll run the code as usual and then we'll jump into see the uh, how it is done. So XML validation using XSD. So in this case I just have a hard-coded path where I know uh, the same two files again uh, same XML file 1 and XML file 2. In this case I'm just ha uh, hard-coded these paths. As we know I use the uh, the app domain uh, directory path to get this path and I know these uh, uh, these uh, files are inside my here. So this is the path where these uh, files are. Um, again, so a little background on how these files are going to be in OBJ file. Okay, we did uh, see this as well. Um, so when I run this program, so what I'm doing here is um, um, I'm actually making this uh, property set to copy to output directory. Okay, uh, for this file and for this file. So both these files are actually going to the copy always. What it means is whenever I run this uh, program, this file will be copied to the output directory. In my case, it is always uh, bin obj, obj folder. Okay, and again, since uh, the, uh, in my uh, solution, this file is under a system.xml root, it creates that folder structure in, within my output directory. So that's why debug and system XML. So this file is exactly same as what we're seeing here. And in that case, we can also have a preview here on the right hand side to see the content is exactly the same content. Okay. 
probably I need more space here but that's fine so hope you can uh, we'll do that validation uh, while running so what the point here is um, so this whole path <coughs> is exactly the, this path that we are looking at okay and in this case uh, as we have done nothing so I'm actually having uh, taken two things here one is an XML file another one is an XST so this is the data file that came in and this is just my XSD which has the document definition uh, that this XML should adhere to and I'm going to run the validation and I see the validation message as a success successful okay so this is a happy path so now we go with the uh, wrong path wherein we'll change the content of the XML file in this case I will just say ID is the same thing what I did in ID I'll say IDN to uh, ID to IDN and save this file and now run the validation so now I see that my validation um, gave me the line number three the line position and the message which is ID and attribute is not declared okay and uh, so the validation is successful and in this case I will roll back my change and save this file and rerun my validation so now again the validation is successful perfect so now I'll do other way around so since I'm actually modifying the XML right so what if I go and change my XSD itself so in this case I come here and I change my XSD IDN and save the XSD file and validate so now again I see the same error for the same line 3 and position 11 so in this case what ideally should happen is there's a two different uh, dimensions so uh, we need to look at uh, one is if you take a look at the XML here of course if you have a preview here it does have uh, so many other line items it, it does have uh, around 10 line items here so when I changed one of the line item I saw the same error which is line 3 and position 11 so in other in in contrast to the XSD change when I change the ID the idea, IDN itself here what ideally should happen is as part of my error messages I should see all of the 10 elements should fail because it doesn't match with any of these uh, attributes right is any of any of these uh, content of this XML file so but I got only the first uh, line um, in the uh, result set the reason being the validation when I do it so it actually picks only the first line which broke the uh, validation and returns the first line and of course there are ways to track uh, and validate all the elements uh, within the uh, XML and then um, you can actually do a robust coding to uh, do the validation of all the elements in the XML file and get it done so in this case uh, by the bottom line is the purpose wise if the XML is invalid in the first line itself that means your validation is done right so you really don't want to know unless you have any specific need to know what all failed in the first hand itself so in this case uh, for me uh, since it's a flat file input from my application and I did my validation and uh, if this is good then only I will load it otherwise no so even if it is one line fail or ten lines fail doesn't matter so in that case uh, this is perfectly good okay so now uh, after changing the XSD I run the validation it's done so what it takes for me to implement this code we'll jump into the validation logic here and uh, of course it's the same text two text boxes I just hard coded uh, uh, and the form load itself to a map to the given path and I have the list box to show those are fundamental things we don't we're not much interested in that part right now okay and uh, yes this is the where I hard coded my XML file name and XST file name and uh, I know that this is going to be in the XML and the X, uh, and uh, this you know we we did talk about this um, uh, literal uh, which is going to be suppressing the escape sequence uh, and the validate button click what we did is we did made use of the XML reader and XML reader we did have a XML reader settings using which we pass the namespace that uh, the XML NS namespace that need to be validated 
using the respective XSD file. And this is where the whole uh, root directory is taken care. We have more space here. Good. Okay, good. So in this case, this is the path that's been used to uh, locate the respective file within this base directory. That means wherever the application is running, uh, we are appending the XSD file. So we get the XSD file name. And now the, the as part of the settings file goes, uh, we are applying the validation type as schema because we are using the XSD schema definition. And we are making use of the reader here and the reader is actually uh, reading the XML file uh, and within the reader we have the XML document and XML, of course using the reader we are loading that into the XML document. Of course you know we need to have an XML reader in order to read uh, the content uh, of a file uh, into an XML document. Again, so we will see the differences uh, uh, between the XML reader writer, XML document and also going to show the X document as well and we'll see which can be used when and what is the base difference between them. As we see one of the difference here is you still need an XML reader to read the content of an XML file and load it into an XML document. Okay, and next comes is the document dot validate. So all we did here is um, uh, when while reading the reader itself, we are passing the respective settings here, which is mapping to the respective XSD file and the XML file. So the reader has information. Once we have the reader loaded into XML document, all we need is to call the uh, document dot validate. And of course, in the validation itself, we are passing an event handler. It takes a parameter called event handler and uh, the event handler goes like this. We'll go to do I go to navigate and go to definition. Yep. So it does uh, get the errors uh, that happens inside your validation. So based on this which case we have the e dot severity. Severity is one of the events R that's coming in and within that we can able to track what is the error that's happening within it. So if you want to track each and every line item, whichever is broken, then this is a place where you want to handle it. And uh, I just do the console write line here um, to track the errors. Um, okay, so that um, and here's where in the form load itself, I'm actually initializing my text box one, text box two with the respect to XML and XSD file path. So I hope that explains and. Um, so that's, that's a very good code example which you might uh, use it if at all you had a chance to work with such kind of scenario down the line. Okay, so that's how the validation works. So we that that will take care of the XSD, programmatic XSD validation. Oops, just give me a second. Okay, so that should take care of that. And next comes is a creating and reading XML document using the link that is X document. Okay, so we'll see the how can we do the same example that we have done with the uh, X document, um, sorry, uh, the XML document and XML reader. So this is the code example I have. Uh, we'll just run the same code snippet and then we'll walk through the code XML demo and I have using X document. So this is another project that I have uh, within which I have these implementations written. Good. So it's the same pretty example uh, wherein I have the create some data. So the data is a is a collection or, or generic list of person which is bound to the grid. And in this case, again, I have to have my watch on the. Uh, oops, I think. Uh, that's where it is. Yeah, debug, and this should be the path where the file should be placed. So this is where my. I hope not. This is not the place. XML features. Yeah, this is the one. So XML features. So this is the when. So I'm going to get rid of the file here. Okay. So this is the place where it should be dropping the file. And just simply write this to the output and we have the file got created. In this case, it's named as an X document. So persons using X document, okay, that's the name we have. And uh, 
if I open the content, so it's an exact match to the data that I have here, a couple of names I have, um, including my name and the first and a couple of other uh, people's names here. And I have those same names here. And again, I'll change the file here, the same demo. I change my name with a full name and I save this and come back to my application and say load data. And I see the change get reflected here. Okay, and also uh, the other one uh, is uh, the watch. Okay, once I start watching, I'll roll back the change that I have done and uh, pay close attention to this name here, this part. It, this should get reflected because I just changed that name here, which we did um, showcased uh, with the oops. Yep, so the after soon after saving, I see that change get reflected. This is an observer pattern implementation. So it's the same pretty much logic, but the only thing is the, uh, what I use here is the X document. <laughs> so I will just walk through the code and see uh, how does the X document code looks like, okay? So in this case, when I create, a doc, uh, create the data, it's the same uh, data wherein uh, I use the person list, a list of a generic, a generic list of persons and I'm banding this to the data source which is a straightforward one. There's no uh, difference with both the cases. So what difference here is the write to XML file. So in this case, um, if you see the line, length of code that I have here is very, very concise, isn't it? Actually, X document is uh, again, a, this is a new uh, class that's introduced in framework 3.5 which can be its main focus is to work with the link to XML and we know what's the language integrated query is and uh, so X document completely supports the link to XML and uh, using which you can actually it has a very rich support for or more documents whether the XML document is a bit uh, it's there since dot uh, framework uh, one dot uh, let me have, a, have my did I have it? Okay, bookmark so that I can come back. We'll quickly go back to the XML document and uh, see how this uh, create file uh, looks like. Okay, so here's uh, how the uh, the the creating a new uh, XML file in X document looks like. And you can imagine uh, how many lines of code we have here and versus the line of code we have here. So it's more concise uh, than the other one, right? So again, in this case, what I did is X document uh, and we're creating the root element here, which is the X element in this case. So everything starts with the X otherwise. So in XML, it's like XML document and XML node. Whereas in X document, it's an X document and X element. And similarly, X attribute as well we have, which will represent the respective attribute. And I'm actually iterating through my person list and uh, to my doc, uh, to the root, I'm actually adding the, you know, we have the XML standard that we, sh we should have only one and only one root element. And that's the reason we're adding all these elements to that root, okay? And you just had an add method wherein I'm just uh, pass calling a function which returns uh, an XML element, oh, sorry, X element, okay? Excuse me. So within this call, I'm passing the P as a person and this is actually transforming the respective person into the X element. So how it is done? We just created an instance of an X element here and we just uh, gave an X name to it. That means the node name uh, or uh, element name here and then uh, added the respective attributes by using the create attribute. And the create attribute, um, how the implementation works, so it is one single line of statement. Um, it just X attribute and we're passing the key value to it and of course we're returning it back. So just to keep my code concise, that's why I just uh, broken this line, this as a separate function um, to keep it concise so that, um, you know, if you see here, this code is more readable. If, if I add all those uh, new attributes, we can do it uh, that way also. There's no problem, but only thing is to keep my code concise, I just go this route.
and I'm passing the name of the attribute and the value to it and this is going to create my person node which is an X element so I'm adding okay let me have a breakpoint here bookmark sorry yeah so once I add all those elements I'm just calling the doc.save so it's that simple with the X document and when I'm reading the document how the code looks like I'm just uh, clearing my local uh, collection here and then loading the uh, file in this case X file that's a constant that maps to the respective file name and X document dot load this is a static method available for the X document uh, which I will make use to create the uh, X document instance I, I, the beauty of X document is again uh, you can actually play you can actually use the X element directly to interact with an XML document um, so as a document level for example if you want to go with the document level declaration aspects or declaration uh, document level settings or schema kind of bindings other things if you want to make use of it then you, you need to go with X document otherwise so if at all you want to really read through an XML document then you, you can actually straight away use the X element itself Actually, that's the beauty of uh, uh, the link to XML. And in this case, I'm making use of X document to be more appropriate. And I just use the load, the static method to load the respective file and create an X document. And in this case, I'm just iterating through each of the X element and within my document. And this is the query, if you see, this is like similar to an XPath query, uh, if you already know about XPath which we can use with XML document but not with X document. So in this case X doc we have a within elements I'm just this is the root element I have persons and within that I have elements. So if you want to this is a kind of a query in other words if you take a look at this so if you what I'm trying to get to is within this root element get me all the elements which is having a name of person. So that's as simple as that you can read that and you can do this with X document. Okay and I'm iterating through getting all the elements, X elements from this uh, X document and then adding that to my person list. Of course, it's the same again as a transformation is done here. In this case, get person from X element is actually taking the X element and creating the and creating the person object here. So it's a it's the other way around on the thing. So this function is actually transforming the given X element to a person wherein it's the same transformation wherein I have a person instance created here and populated the respect to um, properties with the values coming from the X uh, element and rating that out. So it's a simple one um, and uh, where, what else I'm doing? Okay, let's go back. Okay, this is where we are actually uh, loading the X document here and then the X element and creating the respective person and adding to the collection and finally binding to the UI. So that's how uh, it's taken care of. Perfect. So well, the final run of the XML with X document, create this, write to a file and also load it. Okay, so it's uh, of course we don't want it again again we can also see the output where it's getting created uh, I think it's not this place I, I do have two different applications that I just want to make sure we're mapping to the right one um, yeah so this is the place it's getting created and uh, so everything stands same here right to XML and I should be able to see that um, name getting reflected in my document okay and we'll move on to the next topics and we'll see the differences between uh, each of these uh, in the forthcoming slides. Yeah, so before we go to the differences, we'll also take a, uh, more examples on the, the link to objects uh, and see, we, we did see the uh, multi-param filter uh, so far and uh, we'll see a couple of more like we have an order by and select query and a couple of interesting things uh, about the link so this is a different project I have which demos the uh, the queries that I'm talking about so this is a link to uh, this is a link to the objects not to the XML but of course uh, in, uh, in our case we are actually loading the XML 
content into a collection and then applying the link to objects. It's uh, uh, otherwise link to objects or link to uh, XML. Uh, the only difference is uh, from where you're actually retrieving the data. Otherwise, the query-wise, it looks like uh, there's no much difference actually. Oops. Okay, so in this case, uh, we'll have a quick demo here. We we'll create some data. In this case, I have the same collection data here. Uh, or else even I can load from XML in this case, but uh, I'll go with this route. And the filter here with the single param filter. Uh, in this case, uh, age, if it is greater than, for example, I'll say 28. I'll say 28 and search. So I don't see other records, which is less than 28. They're all gone. And um, okay, now I'll apply with age is greater than 1. So I see all. That's a single param filter. And uh, the multi-param filter, uh, in this case, I'll say 100. We did see this uh, multi-param filter with the OR clause between them and also the age as 30. Uh, that means it should get me the records of matching the ID 100 as well as the records that has a greater than 30 age. Okay. And uh, again, I'll clear this before I go to the next one. And the order by filter here, I can even order based on the name. I'll apply the name here, wherein I can see the name is in the um, ordered. In I think it's by descending order probably. And the age, if I can apply, I can apply the age. It's an ascending order. Yeah, this way I can ensure. And also both I can apply. So wherein the yeah, the the first preference is given for the name and followed by the age. So that's how the order by clause can be applied. And the most interesting is the select. Within, if you know the queries that you write normally, within my collection, I can write a select query to pick the respective columns instead of getting everything. So this is how. I'm In this case, I'm picking only the name and hit search and I see only the name. And the other, again, I can pick only the respective age here. So you can apply the everything just like a database query. And what all it takes for me to do this, so the behind the scene, so everything is uh, a link queries that I have. In this case, uh, I have a single param query wherein it's the same from P in the person list where age is greater than or equal to the given age. The age is actually the input from the respective text box. Perfect, so it's a simple query and uh, what else I have from multi-param filter? We did see this example wherein we're actually checking for the um, where clause with uh, or operator or end operator also you can apply. I just had a comment there. It's the same thing which we already saw. And the order by, order by clause, um, it's uh, again, query goes like this. Uh, I don't have any where clause, otherwise I can also have where clause and then order by and select. So if you know the SQL uh, queries and these all these keywords that are should be very familiar to you and I also have uh, the ascending and descending order so I think by default I code it to uh, if it is both then it's uh, descending order by default and if I pick the name it's going to be in ascending order so this is how we can apply the oh sorry so this is a, uh, applied as a descending otherwise I can also apply an ascending order also if I just uncomment this either way it is fine uh, so the point here is you can apply the order by class on uh, the respective uh, uh, fields that I'm picking up and in this case I picked both the fields based on my selection and in this case I picked only the name and the age case I just picked the age. Okay, that's how the order is done and the last one is a selection. This is a little interesting one. So this need to be ha need to have a little attention. Uh, this query here I did not include any other filters here wherein I can still do with where order by and then select new. So far we actually do what we had what we were doing with other queries is we're just selecting P. Okay. Just have to have comparison here. Yeah. <clears throat> so in this case we're actually selecting P. The P is the uh, object in person list, which is person. Right, and uh, in this case, we're actually selecting new of uh, p dot name and p dot age. If you remember, what is this um, statement uh, uh, looks like? The syntax looks like 
uh, we did talk about the, the new feature in 3.5 and that's called anonymous types wherein we wait, we, uh, we did cover uh, saying the types you can you can create uh, types on the fly in line just like this so what we are doing this we are actually creating an anonymous type uh, using the respective p dot name and p dot age okay and uh, to check that we can do a runtime debug here okay we'll have a uh, okay we'll have a breakpoint at both the sides what we will get uh, when we do a select p and what will we get the other case uh, so i had a breakpoint for multi param filter excuse me and it's linked to xml okay in this case what i'm trying is load the data first and then first we'll check the uh, multi param and then we'll go back to the other one 30 hit this uh, query and this query is actually selecting the P okay and let me take a look at what is the content here it has four items and all of these four items are of type person okay from my business object it's my person it's my concrete class implementation of person right which is perfect because I am just selecting the P out of the respective one and now I'll go back and hit uh, the select wherein I select both these columns and hit select and in this case what's happening oops I already passed that line probably I still will I still be able to access this because I, yeah I am still we're just on the edge if I just go out of this line then this will be gone perfect so in this case what I see here is an anonymous type okay. so the anonymous type so we did have an overview that which is introduced in uh, 3.5 and um, I think it's 3.0 if I'm not sure um, so if I'm wrong it should be 3.0 feature that's added up in uh, and whereas the link is introduced in 3.5 uh, so it's uh, you know the anonymous types came in before and then the link started making use of it so it's all like um, part of the roadmap of how the C sharp features has been added up okay so that's the little interesting um, thing with respect to the select part and uh, we have the respective objects created here okay so that's how a couple of queries I just added up and uh, there are uh, MSDN links which are available to um, take a look at uh, where you can go with uh, uh, multiple uh, collections here and apply joins uh, between those collections uh, everything like uh, in a database you can do the joining between two different uh, data tables uh, all that you can do here uh, of course uh, sorting we did the use of the sorting in order by so so again it's open for you to explore and uh, uh, take it from there okay and what else we have yep so here comes the differences between XML reader uh, writer the XML document and X document so a couple of differences we have here uh, we did cover most of them in the in in the uh, while I'm talking about the other respective uh, classes um, so the first one is XML reader and writer and XML document both of them are available from framework uh, 1.1 onwards and of course so uh, they were very primitive when it was when they were available in 1.1 and uh, and today with framework 4.0 uh, uh, and of course forthcoming 4.5 framework which is not yet there but um, so they have a uh, much more rich features uh, included and of course X document as I've been saying it's it's part of the framework 3.5 this came this one came along with the uh, support with the link LINQ it's language integrated query and uh, the purpose when it comes to the XML reader and writer uh, they are used for uh, provides a fast non cache forward only access to XML data so if you can you can rationalize it's a non cache so the data that's been retrieved by XML reader uh, 
cannot be cached into it will not be cached in other words so if this is an ideal fit for processing a large volume of data especially in the first scenario which I, which I talked about when you get a feed into a, into uh, your application you want to read through that file and um, save it to a uh, destination in that case uh, you can actually make use of an XML reader in which case uh, if your if your input file is a very large file which might have a millions of rows uh, or th hundreds of thousands of rows in that case the XML reader is the best fit okay and uh, when it comes to XML document uh, and X document both are actually representing the XML document as a whole so what they do normally is whenever you load a file, they normally use a reader, some reader to read the document and load it into the memory. So of course they internally use the XML reader to load that content into the uh, memory and in, in which case uh, based on the size of your file that you're handling, both of them has some payload on top of that because they both will load the whole file into the memory and then operate on the content of the memory. So once they're loaded and if you have the enough memory in the system uh, based on the size of, size of the file that we're talking about, then further processing of the file wherein you can make use of it to do a query, a filtering, order by and all the thing we did and the X document is going to make use of uh, the link queries to uh, read through the content and apply the queries and all those lambda expressions we talked about, all those things we can apply. And when you come to XML document, you can uh, filter the content using the, the XPath queries. Uh, and XML document is uh, pretty, pretty much uh, dated way back from uh, 1.0 and uh, it follows or adheres to the uh, DOM, XML DOM standards proposed by the W3C. So as part of the document object model, it, it works with the, as, as part of the document object model wherein you have the, the root node and you have elements with the net and it has an attribute. So that's the model, uh, standard definition of a model goes with. And of course the XML reader again adheres to the WCF uh, um, XML standards so again because it's going to read or write a file in other words, okay, and when it reads a file, it reads a very well any file that adheres to the XML standards 1.0 in this case when it was first released and today uh, it supports even the XML standard 1.1 as well, okay, and performance wise if you compare as I've been saying, so if, you, if, it, if you're dealing with a large file, uh, then XML reader or writer is the best fit to go. And if it is, uh, and the next best fit is again X document. X document is the next best fit, uh, which is again faster than X XML document. So XML document again, if you are dealing with a very large files, then XML document is uh, not the right choice. You, uh, if at all you want to leverage the kind of link queries uh, and play with the large documents, then XML document is the best fit. And uh, of course, uh, based on the usage wise, the purpose of your usage wise, uh, you can pick and choose which one you want to go with, okay? And XML, XML writer, in other words, is going to be used only for writing an XML file, okay? And of course, you can also have the combination of both actually. So in which case, you can make use of the X document uh, and the XML, uh, XML reader uh, so let the uh, reader can read the content and create an XML reader, wherein in which case X document, uh, where is this? Let me go back to the, okay, it should be here, X document, okay, it's not part of this project, it's part of a different one. Yeah, here you go. Uh, if I take uh, to the respective definition here, X document has a couple of uh, members, in this case the load it has a couple of uh, flavors to it, in one of them is again XML reader. You can pass an XML reader there, uh, again text reader is again, uh, is, it's a concrete implementation of XML reader, so again it uh, follows the same thing. Um, and text, if you can open as a, you can a flat file as a plain text uh, and then pass it as a reader to X document to create that uh, document in memory. Once you do this, what happens is the whole document is loaded into the XML uh, X document and that will be in memory henceforth. So again, the memory constraints are will apply to 
um, the X document or XML document. And query, you can use the XPath query and for XML document and X document, you can use the link. A link is the most latest one. And of course, link has more advantages when we make use of the parallel task library or the parallel link, uh, which is uh, the new concept introduced in 4.0 framework. Uh, again, for XPath, it's again traditional way to deal with the file, and which is much slower than the link. And the payload, again, the XML reader, it doesn't cache anything, so it's a non-cached or data access of forward only again, so you can't use XML uh, reader to maintain a live uh, uh, updates to the respective file and uh, make use of it. And um, in this case, the payload uh, with, the, with respect to XML reader and writer, there's none. It's uh, because it's not going to cache the data in memory. Whereas for XML document and X document, they both will load the whole document from the memory. So that's going to be the payload. So using X document, there's one of the other example I, that I have is that you make use of the two string override. Uh, just uh, give me a second. So yeah, I just commented this line of code here. I did not walk to you through that. So in this case, what happens if, for example, uh, I take away all this code, okay? So I'm not using the create attribute of everything. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm passing the uh, the person whenever whenever it's a create element, I'm just passing the person directly, okay? And uh, what this is going to spit out? Let's see. I'm going to go back to the same thing. Okay, I'll get rid of this file. So, what instead of uh, creating an attribute and adding it to it, what I'm trying to do is I'm just adding the person as an object directly to it. That's what I meant to say. Okay, I'm going to run this code using X document. Uh, I load the same data and write to the file before that. Uh, Let's keep an eye on this uh, right hand side to get that file, yeah. So if I open this file, if you see, uh, within, it still have the person object with the data, but if the data is right now, it's not in a, as an XML uh, attributes, but it's actually just a content of the person, but this, this is still a valid XML file because the uh, within which when you try to read the value, the way you read it, it's going to be a little different. Uh, how, how did this happen is uh, because of the override that I have on the two string. What uh, internally uh, the Excel element, whenever I add this, it says is going to actually make the call to the two string of the respective person object and, uh, okay, I'm sorry. So, uh, yeah, make a two string of my uh, call to my two string. So I just override my two string to return that uh, CSV output, so which is getting out into my output file. So there are ways in which you can actually leverage the um, X document, uh, X document usage-wise. So it's going to be pretty neat and clean. You can actually write uh, a very simple code and that's what I mean to say uh, by reducing a lot of code, line of code and as I mentioned uh, we can also write uh, um, when I create a document uh, itself if you take a look at the constructor what all different types of constructors we have I can go back to the code and the even see so you have a constructor code here which one of them is in a params of uh, array of objects and another one is uh, you can pass an object directly and the other one is a XM, X declaration uh, which stands for your first line declaration and the param of objects. Straight away you can actually uh, create if you already have an array of elements that you can pass it in and then you can make it, uh, create the next document directly and just hit save. And um, that takes care of the XML uh, uh, that I wanted to cover and uh, we will jump into the the next topic uh, which is a com com after a, after after a very quick uh, break okay let's take a quick break and then uh, continue with the com okay I'm sure many of you have uh, 
um, heard this keyword called com in the in the real world of course a lot of people do ask in the resume also uh, as a skill set requirement uh, to have a com background also the com has again multiple um, keywords you will see com complex decom and so on so again so we'll see all of that today uh, with respect to and its significance with the dot net and uh, we will see again uh, also uh, how to create a com component uh, and also consume that in the dot net so that's the key thing there at the end at the end uh, people do expect you to know what is a com uh, of course, a single line should be good enough. And uh, also, how can you consume the com components inside a .NET applications? Uh, this is especially going to be very useful when uh, you uh, when you get into any project, uh, which is going to be an upgrade project uh, from a legacy uh, code to the .NET code. So there are a ton of projects that I have even come across uh, uh, assessing people's uh, requirements so they do have uh, it's a very strong uh, area people do expect uh, you to know um, so this is again a very important topic and uh, please pay, pay a little attention um, so hope if you know already so it's again you can refresh your um, knowledge over it probably probably you'll still have some value addition if you um, here once again Okay, so the COM stands for a component object model, and a little background to the COM um, is a, it's actually a standard. Uh, whenever someone says like uh, it's a web service, web service is again a standard. It's not specific to any language. It's not specific to any corporation. It's it's actually a standard. A standard can be proposed by any uh, any individual or a corporation or. A, a group of individuals doesn't matter you you all know what is a standard right uh, if you say ISO is a standard and there's an organization which proposed these kind of standards and if industry accepts that uh, as a, a very good standard which which would works good for them uh, it becomes an industry accepted standard and uh, henceforth people will look forward to see so again, so if you have a little bit background of what is a standard again, why it is why it is required, right? Um, why it is required? It is required because um, when we deal with the heterogeneous people or heterogeneous applications, uh, want to integrate with each other, uh, it's always important uh, that but they both talk to each other with a common channel, right? It's the same uh, relationship like uh, between the human as well. Uh, when uh, one person want to talk to another person, they should have an uh, interchangeable uh, conversation which both can understand, right? If one is a Chinese, another one is an American, if, if they want to talk to each other, then they should have some media of communication, a common channel which both, both can understand and wherein the standard comes into play. Uh, as for the standards, like what I'm giving an example of uh, interoperability, as specific and when it is a standard comes to play it's more an ex addition to that interoperability again um, so saying that um, standard exactly refers to the uh, methodologies or tools or techniques or approaches uh, that you adopt to build a system in general so that, that becomes a standard in terms of the uh, computer science Again, if your measurements has its own standards, you have units of measurements, again a standard throughout the world. So if a, an inch is an inch throughout the world, so that's again an uh, advantage of having a standard. Okay, the COM is again a standard. Um, so this is a standard proposed by the Microsoft in 93 and, uh, and it is actually a, a standard for inter-process communication. Uh, between uh, multiple objects. Um, this is especially uh, useful when um, applications written in multiple languages like uh, Java, C, C++, uh, and again VB6.0, again .NET, again too. Uh, there are a ton of other languages out there definitely. If they want to talk to each other, uh, especially this is important when it goes to the internet because internet is a network of networks and a given network could be in a different platform and different language another network could be in a different so this uh, heterogeneous networks talking to each other can be possible only when um, two other applications written in two different domains or two different uh, 
uh, language can able to talk to each other. So this is one of the standard proposed to achieve that intercommunication between processes. Um, and that's, uh, the, this is one of the, again, a backbone or even, even it's, uh, it's, it's not a deprecated completely, it's still there. If you open the office, uh, even 2007 or uh, 2010, VBA is one of the things that's still there. So you create uh, uh, the, the, the COM is a technology that is used at the client machines. Uh, it is still in use. Uh, it's not that it's completely gone, uh, but it's a little gone away from the .NET. So it's a rich uh, interface, that, uh, in, uh, standard that is adopted by Microsoft and also accepted by the industry. Um, so it's used widely in Microsoft applications. Uh, uh, the most popular are the OLE, OLE Automation, uh, ActiveX, Complex, and DCOM. And the C Complex is what we'll see again. What is the DCOM? Again, we'll see that. So ideally, the component object model itself uh, stands for designing and building components which can talk to each other. So you can build a COM component either using a Java, script, a Java language or a VB language or a C++ language or C, uh, C language, it doesn't matter. So as long as they adhere to the, um, the, uh, the standard, they can talk to each other. And to make it possible, uh, the one step into the standard, so the COM publications, whenever you publish any component saying this is a COM component, they minimally have to adhere to uh, implement the I unknown interface. Again, if you see the interface is not a, a specific to .NET, and uh, so interface is again not specific to uh, .NET again. So interface is specific to the object-oriented programming, or even of course uh, object-based programming. That's fine. Uh, so the I unknown interface is the key uh, uh, interface that need to be implemented uh, for any object. Uh, to be called as a uh, adhere to a COM component. So as long as uh, if you say what is a COM component, you can say simply give a single answer saying it's a component that implements the I unknown interface. Uh, so many people uh, won't go that level, but if you can give you that kind of answer, people do definitely appreciate it. Um, so so if you if someone asks you what is a COM, then COM is a component written in any language but implements the I unknown interface. So what is this I unknown interface contains? As we know, interface do have an abstract methods, right? So in I unknown interface has three abstract methods which need to be implemented and provide the body for that. And the, the first one is the add ref. What it does is uh, it's used by the uh, by the client to indicate that the com object is being referenced. This is necessary to ensure that the com object is not disposed permanent uh, prematurely. So what it means is whenever uh, a an object is refers this com component, what it's going to add is a, a, a the reference counter. There's something called reference counter in the uh, memory, which will be incremented to one. Similarly, uh, if you see, if you, this is a relatively same topic, uh, if you map to the garbage collection, uh, if you see the root object, uh, the, the root object uh, in the object tree uh, refers to a next object and so on. So there is an object reference happens, right? So whenever the reference is gone, that means the object can be uh, collected for reclaim the memory by the garbage collector using the mark and sweep algorithm which we did walk through in detail. So it's the same concept here as well. So when a add ref is actually going to increment a reference counter in the, uh, in the memory, so it, which indicates that this object uh, has been referred by so many other objects. So that's going to give you a reference counter. So at any given point of time, if you look at the, uh, the variable that's holding the number of references, uh, which is updated by the add ref implementation will tell you that this component is been referred by so many other components at one time. So that's what the add ref implementation is going to take care of it. It's pretty simple, nothing complicated. And release, so the release is just opposite to it. So once you add a reference to it, um, soon after someone say, uh, uh, someone's object goes out of scope, the release is going to be called which will decrement the reference to my, by minus one. So 
So, uh, so if you have uh, five uh, references and four uh, got out of scope, then you will have the reference count is still one, right? So it's simple math, five minus four. So release is going to decrement that counter. So it's used by the clients to indicate that they have finished using the com object and the uh, an unreferenced com object may be safely disposed. So whenever the disposed things uh, comes into play, uh, that can be safely disposed by the the runtime. The again, this is the most important thing is the query interface. So since it's a, if you see the name itself is an unknown interface. Uh, so the unknown interface says that okay, so uh, you trying to, when a, this unknown interface is going to fire whenever you're going to create an instance of the respective object or respective class. So when you create an uh, instance of the respective class, what should happen is uh, you should know uh, what is the type of this object is and what it contains. So this query interface is going to do exactly that. Um, and this interface is going to be used to obtain the point to another interface uh, given a GUID that uniquely identifies that interface. So in COM, everything is driven using the GUIDs. Uh, in a, uh, for example, if you create a COM component with uh, five methods in it, so each of the method uh, will have an interface ID. Okay. In other words, called as an IID. Uh, interface ID will have an and again the class itself will have a unique identifier, uh, which is a globally unique identifier. Using that unique identifier, the instance of the class uh, can happen. So we will, uh, I will uh, show you some of that again uh, in the in the demo today. And the rig SVR32 uh, is a tool that you can use to. Uh, in the register or unregister the components, COM components. So that's one of the biggest uh, uh, drawback with the COM. COM is a very, very successful, again, uh, don't underestimate COM potential. Uh, before the .NET in the market, COM has been the most successful model um, which was adopted by a large, uh, large scale applications and it, it has been in use. Uh, for a very long time, uh, probably at least uh, two decades, since 93 uh, till now, it's, a, it's almost like a two decades uh, it's been in use. And uh, yes, that's a, that has been a very well adopted technology at that time till before the uh, .NET came into market. Okay, so the biggest drawback, what is the biggest drawback? How the COM works actually? So whenever the COM works, it works based on the Windows registry. So when a COM component is created, the COM component need to be registered into the Windows registry. What, the, what does this registry contains? Uh, we will try to see, but as an overview, it's going to contain the information where the DLL is physically in your disk, number one, uh, and uh, what is the name of the uh, class that you are holding and also as I mentioned each and every method in the uh, class uh, all public interfaces again not the private ones all the public interfaces will have a uh, separate unique identifier which is called an IID it's an interface ID we, whenever someone creates an instance of a given class what, what happens uh, technically is that the instantiator will look up into the registry and see that if this uh, module name, class name, whatever you're trying to create instance is available in the registry or not. So that's the lookup is a registry. So once it finds the uh, item in the registry, what it's going to see immediately is the GUID for that. And the respective GUID has an, another entry in the, machine, uh, in the system, in the registry itself, which will pinpoint to the uh, DLL file uh, physically where it's going to exist and then it's going to load that DLL into memory and then create the instance in the memory and do the same INO interface uh, overloads called the add ref release and other things will come into play. And if there is no entry in the registry, uh, in the Windows registry, then it's going to throw up an exception saying that its uh, uh, instantiation is failed. 
um, because it cannot able to find the object in the registry. So if you, uh, although that means if you have the file on your uh, file system and it's not registered, that means uh, you cannot make use of the COM components. So that actually become a, a very big bottleneck for the failure of COM component and in other words that mechanism is a big uh, trouble or a bottleneck in terms of um, when you have multiple versions of the same component. It's quite common that uh, you have a, for example, you have designed a math component version 1.0 and uh, of course there, there are a couple of changes identified, there are a couple of issues identified in your first release which need to be fixed and released as part of 2.0, right? And uh, the same component, uh, for example, in my machine I have uh, 10 different applications making use of the same version 1.0. Now in order to uh, promote my new version 2.0 of the same component, what I need to do is I need to carefully first see that the what, whichever applications are making use of it um, need not should not break. But in the COM case, it's going to break because when you create a new uh, version out of it, what happens is it's it going to have its own set of GUIDs uh, again when you, when you compile and publish it and uh, the applications which are using right now, uh, you actually need to uninstall the existing component and then reinstall the new component. But that is possible, which can be done. What happens uh, if you have changed any of the signatures within the component? So the existing applications will start crumbling, it's going to break. Um, so that means uh, you cannot have uh, you have to upgrade all the 10 applications which are relying on the version 1.0 to consume version 2.0. So that's one of the major uh, drawback uh, with the COM in terms of the maintenance wise. So that's the reason in terms of uh, .NET uh, there's no concept called a registry. Although it, it does the same thing in a different way which is called the GAC which is a global assembly cache wherein the uniqueness is determined based on the the public key token, which is the strong name. Uh, but you can still have uh, multiple versions of the same assembly sitting in a GAC at the same time, so which overcomes the uh, DLL hell, in other words. So that's why the this scenario is called, referred by the industry as a DLL hell, uh, wherein the uh, compatibility between the multiple versions and uh, 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 becomes a major problem when you deal with the COM components and that's the reason now uh, COM is getting replaced by the dot and assemblies and of course it's not easy uh, for any um, upgrades to replace the COM interfaces directly because uh, it, industry has spent almost uh, a decade in building these COM components and it's not easy for most of the firms to rewrite those in .NET for the reason being it might have a very complex code built in and you, you don't know the business uh, uh, rules probably if you don't know how it's going to affect uh, the business. So in most of the scenarios so these components are still there where even if you upgrade the .NET application to uh, a, the given application to a .NET platform. Uh, so people are doing it vice versa, so uh, at a given stage you might get into a scenario wherein you have to consume this COM components inside a .NET uh, application, which is a very, very common scenario and, and we will, we're going to see that today and uh, you will have a good uh, overview how it can be done. It's not complicated, it's very, very simple. Okay, now what is complex? Complex is an, a little bit of addition to COM. It could be could have, could have been said as a COM version 1.0 and COM version 2.0. Uh, COM plus uh, comes in Windows 2000. And it's got introduced in Windows 2000, um, and uh, the addition is that the addition in that operating system is the MTS. The MTS is, stands for the Microsoft Transaction Server. So Windows 2000 is one of the server operating system. And um, the MTS is, uh, uh, is ideally responsible for uh, making the, the communications between the networks, objects on the network 
uh, whereas com as I said it's going to be more at the client client level it doesn't talk to other co other components in the network so the MTS uh, when it's coming transaction server going to be used for uh, trans uh, make communication between multiple uh, servers and the objects on the servers in other words you can also call it as a networking um, so com plus is got introduced and wherein you can actually host uh, a com component as an application in the com plus so com plus itself is a, a an area in the operating system where you can uh, host another component that can be running and uh, using uh, the application process area which manages your com at runtime uh, can actually do many things. What it can do is it can do the resource pooling, uh, it can also do the disconnected applications, even a published subscription pattern. Uh, so the com component can be published on a, one server and multiple other applications can subscribe to it. Uh, and also most commonly uh, used uh, for distributed transaction uh, wherein you can have uh, a transactions established between multiple servers or multiple databases uh, sitting on a different hardware uh, box completely. So you have a database one on box one and database two on box two. Both can be uh, completely different uh, databases. Uh, one can be a SQL Server, another one can be Oracle and you want to maintain a transaction between those two it, which is possible by the uh, transaction, so, transaction manager um, which is MTS. Uh, so MTS is actually the, the first version of the distributed transaction world wherein the COM plus got introduced. Uh, so we are right now I am having uh, uh, the of course the the command line uh, uh, command for DCOM CNFG uh, is a command line to see the configuration uh, which is again still works good in um, uh, Windows 7. Otherwise, it's still a, a good command uh, starting from Windows 2000 uh, is a command line uh, configuration tool. The com cnfg if I hit, what I'm going to see is exactly this. So, so that's what we have here. We have the co um, component services. So this is where you can host your complex applications. Uh, so down the line if you get into any project and uh, people say you need to install the, this into the com plus then uh, don't worry so it's uh, com plus is pretty simple just remember the command line or else you can also get into this uh, from the administrative tools and come to this place uh, as component services the shortcut I have I always been using as a DCOM CNFG in uh, here if you see uh, the system applications, there are still a lot of components here available as part of the Windows uh, 7 and uh, you can actually create an, uh, one uh, uh, as an application here. You can, it's pretty simple, it's a GUI, create new application and then uh, drag and drop any of the DLLs that you have which is, which is as good as doing the rig SV, uh, SV32. Uh, okay, this is what the demo is anyway. So if you see the rig sv 32 we will see that. Don't worry about that. I'm going to show you the demo of the rig sv 32 when wherein we create a com component and then register it in the Windows uh, registry using the uh, rig sv 32 and then consume it in the uh, .NET application. Uh, that we'll see today, which is um, needed. For of course, we, what we will not see today is uh, a demo of the complex applications. So it's a pretty much similar thing. Only thing, the uh, only thing different from uh, the uh, the standalone rig sv 32 and the complex application is that the uh, as a as an application, you can actually host your DLL as an application, which can be managed by your operating system at runtime. And using this, you can actually grant permissions for uh, other applications to access this and also it makes use of the MTS uh, from the operating system to make a distributed transaction possible uh, which eventually it turned out uh, uh, to be DCOM again so distributed transaction again if you see take a look at this DCOM here of course so this is uh, erroring out right now because uh, we need to run the uh, this tool in the uh, as an admin otherwise um, 
Uh, okay, so this is a DCOM config uh, wherein you can actually have your application as a distributed component. Um, so what is the difference with that? So distributed component object model again uh, is a little uh, one step ahead to accomplish, uh, which is uh, again for the communication among software components uh, distributed across networked computers. Again, this is a wide um, uh, open to more, more than one network. And again, so DCOM is again not for internet, it is actually for intranet applications only where the, uh, the components hosted on the network can uh, gain access to it. And it's originally termed as a network OLE. OLE, if you are not familiar with the keyword, it, uh, it's mandatory that you need to know what is an OLE. Uh, it stands for Object Linking and Embedding. Uh, it's the first thing that Microsoft has brought in actually as a technology uh, wherein you can embed other type of objects into another object using the OLE. Uh, a typical example of an OLE is uh, having a having a picture inside a Word document. Uh, that's a typical example of an OLE or embedding another uh, spreadsheet uh, a spreadsheet document inside a Word document. Uh, that's an OLE example. Uh, that's a pretty good example of an um, object linking and embedding. And uh, it's uh, and the same concept is extended to a network OLE wherein um, uh, heterogeneous uh, systems can talk to each other. And of course, all implement the same COM technology. Uh, again, so it's uh, it under uh, it works under the same uh, complex uh, application server infrastructure, um, which is the which is what we have just seen. Now uh, it has been uh, deprecated in favor of .NET framework. Uh, it has been deprecated uh, officially, but still outside the market, there are ton of other applications which still uh, make use of the com dcom. So that's the reason it's important for us to know. They send it. The D is added to COM because of the distributed computing environment. Uh, in other words, remote procedure calls, uh, heavily usage of the RPC and uh, DCE. If you look at the competitors of this technology in the market, uh, uh, Corba is the competitor. Uh, it stands for Common Object Request Proctor Architecture, which many of you uh, may know if you have done the Java programming. Now we'll come into the RCW. Don't worry, it's not too much of theory. Uh, we will see some practicals also, very good practicals. I'm going to actually pretty much write the end to end uh, from the scratch. Um, okay, so the so now comes the COM and .NET interoperability. So since we know we know what is an unmanaged code and a COM is an unmanaged code because it's not a .NET code. In other words, it's as, as straightforward as uh, uh, since COM is an unmanaged code and dot .NET assemblies are managed code, that means what is a managed code and unmanaged code? That's an again very fundamental question. So whatever CLR can understand, if you say it's simple, uh, CLR can understand only the MSIL. Whatever is an MSIL, uh, it runs under the CR, CLR uh, domain. So whatever a CLR can uh, read and execute, uh, at runtime, manage it at the runtime, it's called unmanaged code. Uh, whatever it cannot, uh, what that means whatever is not an MSIL, so whatever is not a .NET code is an unmanaged code. An example, C++, Java, C, um, uh, COBOL, all these are unmanaged codes. So they need to have their own runtime to run uh, explicitly, in, it could be on the same uh, uh, process area or it could be in other process area, it doesn't matter, but uh, they cannot run within the CLR process. So they ha they always run outside the CLR process area uh, because of the manageability, because CLR cannot manage their resources at runtime, resources in terms of how they load into memory and how the resources are allocated for that kind of a process and how the threads are managed for them, so on. So that's uh, completely outside the CLR domain. As simple as if the, you know, the cleaning up the COM components from the memory once they are got used is again outside the completely .NET uh, or CLR 
uh, managed area. So that's why they are called unmanaged code. Now, so SICOM is an unmanaged code and uh, .NET assemblies are managed code and that's when the communication between these two becomes a complex. Uh, though it's, it's complex, uh, but still it can be done using a, in an intermediate. Uh, the intermediate is normally referred to as a proxy. A proxy is again a very, very common keyword that you might see in terms of a networking. Um, so whenever you deal with the networking uh, communications between uh, your local network to another LAN, LAN, LAN communication, so this always comes into play as a proxy which, which, uh, which is going to pretty much stand behind the firewall and uh, try to uh, make sure that whichever, whoever is making a call to the external network uh, is a valid um, a call going around. It could be another uh, gatekeeper to check whether you are a valid user to make this call or not. It, in other words, proxies do authenticate your uh, requests outside. That's a general thing. Uh, again, so in other words, the proxy are an intermediate uh, brokers between two channels or between two um, uh, applications. So in this case, uh, COM and uh, .NET both work in a two different uh, uh, process areas but they need to talk to each other and they can talk to each other by the use of a proxy and in this case this proxy is called as a uh, RCW. It's called a runtime callable wrappers. This is again, this is one of the way to consume a comp, uh, .NET comp, um, consume a com component inside a .NET application. Uh, there is another way also which is called a p-invoke, uh, which is called as a platform invoke, in which case you will not have the uh, the wrapper over the com component in the .NET, which I'm not showing in this demo, but you can actually create a com component using the uh, the old way of creating instance of the respective component by using the create object. Uh, class which is available as part of the Visual Basic uh, in .NET na uh, namespace. So today we're going to see the runtime callable wrapper uh, which is much easier than the the uh, Microsoft Visual Basic route. Uh, again, see uh, the namespace which I was referring to, um, if I go to the object browser here, if I see a system dot Visual Basic Yep, there you go. As part of the standard practice, uh, Microsoft provides this namespace as a backward compatibility for the VB6.0 uh, but uh, they always recommend uh, to use the .NET specific uh, or .NET uh, related classes in place of the Microsoft uh, Visual Basic namespace because uh, the uh, in the future is ideally this namespace is marked for deprecation because it's been still available. Uh, whoever knows VB6.0 like me uh, can still uh, write VB6.0 code in .NET. That's still possible. That's because of this namespace. Okay. Okay. So what does that mean? Again, don't need to worry about it. You don't really have to care about it as long as you know you, you just know there's something called. Microsoft Visual Basic, and if you have time and interest, you can actually explore what all it has. And today we're going to see the runtime and callable wrapper. Okay, so to make use of the runtime callable wrappers, what we need is a translator. As we know, proxy is kind of a translator between two um, ends. So one end is a .NET CLR, another one is the uh, the com runtime. The com runtime. Um, to know the uh, the type that you have, of course, ideally at the at bottom line is that you have a same class uh, information, like it has a class and attributes to it, and you want to know uh, all uh, all the attributes of a given class and its interface elements. In other words, whatever is public uh, interface of that given class, it could be a property, it could be a method, function, anything, uh, doesn't matter. So whatever is public. Uh, publicly available, we need all those interface uh, into the .NET. So, so to make your code easy at design time, 
what you need is a wrapper over the com component com is actually inside a registry uh, and as if as a physical file in your machine but that need to be available as a dotnet code inside a dotnet application uh, so that you can actually uh, write your dotnet code um, over uh, that uh, com component so that's possible using the wrapper so once you how you get that wrapper is by using the type library import so if you uh, see the type uh, uh, tlb import is a command line uh, uh, tool that's available uh, which you can make use of it to pass the dll uh, which is your uh, com component and emit the dll uh, .NET specific dll so that the once you can add a reference of this .NET DLL inside your uh, program and write your code just as you're referring to a .NET DLL. Okay, so the wherein the IntelliSense will help you uh, identify what are the public interface elements uh, that this COM component has. Okay, so that's how it is uh, easy to do it. But again, this is uh, although it is easy to use TLB import we will have a much easier route to uh, do it. We'll do it in a much easier route, okay? In other words, if you use this tool, uh, say that you have a COM component available, somebody gave you the DLL, this is the component. And also, in other words, somebody did not give you a DLL, so they said that there is something called uh, XYZ.CLS uh, component available, which is their part of your machine. Uh, you need to know where it is actually in the physically. So if you want to know that, you just have to go to the rig edit and find it, find it out. So uh, we'll we'll see that also, right? Um, TLB input will give you creating a wrapper in general. So if you look at this uh, diagram, this is an uh, abstract uh, from the MSDN itself, uh, uh, which ha which tells you the the link between the um, uh, the managed code and the unmanaged code. Uh, the managed code in this case is the .NET .exe, which is going to make call, make a call to the COM component using the RCW. Uh, so this is a runtime callable wrapper is, in other words, called an interop assembly. This is also called as an INTEROP uh, assembly. Okay, so it's also called as an interop assembly, and uh, in other words, uh, it's also called as a RCW, runtime callable wrapper. Okay, good. So uh, in this case, what happens is uh, the RCW will actually make the call to the respective COM uh, in the unmanaged code, and it will manage the communication between both whenever the dot and code is going to do it. It's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward, not uh, an alien. So now, enough of our uh, slides. We will jump into action. Okay, so how to create a COM component. Now, anyway, whatever I'm going to show you right now uh, uh, is not necessary for you to know, but of course, sometimes it might be necessary because people in the market do ask uh, experience on COM, and yeah, that could be, if you know this, how to create a COM component and how to debug a COM component, then it's going to make your life easier. So, uh, since I have, uh, 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 Windows 7. So Windows 7, you cannot actually have 32-bit uh, uh, applications running straight away. I need to actually make use of the uh, Windows XP mode to run. Uh, probably this may not be the ideal situation for you. Uh, you. If you have an XP machine directly, so you don't have to worry about. If at all you have to work on Windows XP, uh, then uh, you have to be aware that you can run the XP based applications uh, inside Windows 7 by using the uh, Windows XP mode and this is what I'm trying to do since it's an old application it's a 32 bit application uh, I'm actually using the so this is the old visual basic uh, in other words if you have never seen this uh, take a close look at this and you will see a lot of similarities uh, between .NET and the old one Okay, um, and again, as you see, this is, these are the project templates, and uh, you have existing, recent, and other things. And uh, this is the Visual Basic IDE, which, I, which probably you are least bothered about it, uh, unless until you come into a situation where you have to work on this. 
but believe me, this is not too bad. Uh, it is not too bad like a Delphi or you know C++ Turbo C, but it's very intuitive. This is again one of the most popular tool uh, during uh, those days, probably a decade uh, before .NET came to market. Okay, in this case, oh, I'm not worried about EXC or ActiveEXC. ActiveX uh, again, if you you might have already seen uh, what is an ActiveX technology again, right? So ActiveX technology again uh, stands for um, the com creating a com components using uh, the Microsoft of course com is a standard so you actually use the ActiveX technology to build components uh, for com com based components in other words so I showed you three interfaces which are called the I unknown interface add ref, release and also query interface uh, you really don't have to worry about those you don't have to even think about them when you do ActiveX although you create com components which internally does the same implementation of i unknown interface uh, when you do with the uh, activex technology you you don't really have to see them uh, live because those are uh, implemented implicitly so it's kind of a, a wrapper over that and uh, you can actually straight away create the components with ease you don't have to worry about those things of course, if you write in any other platform like a C++ or Java, then uh, they, you will definitely see these interfaces uh, as part of your code. And in uh, ActiveX, you don't see them, although they do it internally. Okay. So in this case, I am interested in uh, creating an ActiveX uh, DLL, which is going to be a dynamic link library, which is a library. Uh, of course, ActiveX controls are going to be like user controls, which can be used in uh, in a web page as well, you might have seen uh, if you're using a web pages, they might uh, uh, give you a prompt saying uh, this ActiveX control is not there and so on. So this is the uh, same thing. So you can actually build a control that you can host on a web page or as a control on your Windows application and so on. So we don't want to go there. Okay, so ActiveX DLL. I'm going to create new. It gives a plain uh, screen. It doesn't even give me a class name or a predefined structure that Visual Studio does give. Um, in this case, what I'm going to do is um, for the demo, we're going to create uh, a small uh, uh, class uh, and try to consume that inside our uh, .NET project. So for the demo purpose, I'm going to actually uh, take as simple as the math class. Okay. And this project, uh, I'm going to uh, give a name, project properties, and the project name, I'll say my math project. Okay, I'll say my math project. And uh, of course, so this has a version number and other things, icons and all. This is, of course, in uh, DLL. And uh, that's all I think I'm cared about it right now. So that's the project name and of course the class name. So I can uh, give the class name here uh, saying the CLS say math, math class. And a math, cla uh, and a math class can have add a procedure, say function and say add. And call, also you can define the scope and it's going to create it for you. And just like we use a written statement in VB uh, in any other language like a C sharp or a C++, there is nothing called a written here. What uh, usually happens, of course, add will take some parameters. In this case, I'll take, uh, of course, this is a VB script, right? So same thing goes like a dim statement. Okay. And in this case, so we don't do dim here. What we do is uh, value one as integer. IntelliSense is still there, although this is a 10-year-old product, right? So it's there. IntelliSense is very powerful in VB6 as well. Okay, and we take two parameters here and what we're going to do is uh, return the, uh, the summation of that. How we do that? We actually need to assign the output directly to the method name. That's how um, the Uh, uh, functions in VB6 uh, work. This is again doable in uh, .NET again. Uh, take a try. 
in .NET, you can still do this way. Uh, not in C sharp definitely. This is this can be done in uh, VB .NET also. Uh, try assigning the return output to a method name. It will still work. You can give it a try. So this is uh, again uh, VB 6.0 is uh, very similar to uh, Visual Basic .NET VB .NET again. So all these things you can still do it. Okay, to keep my uh, example simple, I'm going to add uh, okay two more. It's as good as uh, what I'm going to do here is uh, subtract. Well, the only thing is uh, I'll need to change uh, this here to minus and. Uh, multiply and overloading is still there you can actually have a, a club, same name with different variable parameters which is still possible as we see uh, we did talk about the object based versus object oriented programming language and VB6 is an object based programming language wherein the inheritance is not available otherwise uh, it has the polymorphism uh, available Okay, so this is simple, good, pretty good enough. Uh, can I run this? I cannot run this because uh, uh, because this is not a uh, self-executable. Uh, so I cannot run this. What I'm going to do is to test my um, library, I need some executable code, right? So what I'm going to do is uh, add some Windows EXE projects which can um, add a new project. This is kind of a test client for me here and I have these uh, tools available okay I'm going to test this class um, of course before I do that I need to publish this uh, com so this is a com component because I, uh, as you see I don't see any of those I unknown interface add of release uh, and query interface uh, implementations because it, this is an ActiveX uh, and I'm using ActiveX uh, technology to create a COM component and all of those interfaces are implemented implicitly and all I need to do is uh, make uh, my math DLL so what I'm going to do is to keep it simple I'm going to put it somewhere in my C temp okay this is the file name and options is there anything no this version name and all I don't want to care about it right now Okay, so that's all I need. Which I couldn't see here. Yep, there you go. Now I have the DLL. So all I care about is the DLL. Um, the other information is uh, the lib is a type library information, which has which I really don't care about. Um, so what we're going to do right now is uh, test this DLL, right? Okay, let me save this project first. I want to save this uh, again on uh, C temp again. Okay? Let me save it in the C. Okay, let me create a folder. Okay. So, add source save now. And of course, I want to save all other things. No, no, yes. So I'm just saved all the things. And what I need to do is I want to use this. Uh, it's not going to be project reference because I want to make use that as a DLL. To do that, what I'm going to do here is register this DLL. So to do that, what I need to do is again um, go to the command prompt. Okay, so go to the command prompt. How should I? Actually, because this is Windows 7, I need to run the command prompt to register this in the administrator, as an administrator. So do that. I go to accessories and then right click on the command and run as administrator. This is important. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, it, it, this is the same thing will happen even if you do it in Vista. The unless you run such programs uh, at as an administrator it's not going to let you do it because it act, it takes uh, special permissions whenever you deal with the uh, windows uh, or windows system files especially the registry so in this case what i'm going to do is uh, use the 
uh, rig as we are 32 tool to register this. Can I do drag and drop? Doesn't look like it's going to work because it's in administrator mode. Temp and uh, my math project. <coughs> uh, dot dll. Hope I am correct with the spelling. The module failed to load. Is it correct? Let me see. See temp uh, my math project. Oops, there we go. It's my bad. Project dot dll. And that's a successful message. So this indicates that the DLL registry in CTEMP uh, my math project in DLL succeeded. So that means uh, it's successfully registered. So what happens when I do this? What happens is it's going to actually create uh, entries into the, into the registry. If you go and search uh, in, in your registry for your project, I'm going to copy this name and look for this. If it is, if it's going to take a long time, then I'm going to cancel it because it might sometimes take a very long time to look up for this item. So what it does uh, is it's going to uh, take this information of the DLL uh, along with its version number and other things, the metadata. In other words, uh, yes, there you go. You could able to locate it. So what happens here is it has created an entry for my project and it has a GUID created. If you see this, this is the GUID created for my TLL in the Windows registry. Once you try to create an instance of it, what it's going to look for is the this name. This is the project name and the class name. So if you have 10 different classes, then each class will have its own GUID in the system. And what happens here is once it finds this GUID, I'll uh, copy this uh, GUID. Okay. It's going to look up uh, using this GUID. For the first step is it's going to find the GUID and it find the GUID and using this GUID. Okay. Okay. This is the first thing we have and uh, I'm going to hit F3 to find next. The other entry with the GUID will have the information of the uh, DLL where it is uh, available in the system. So the next entry is going to be this one. So it has the all the information about the uh, file. And if you look at the Inprox Server 32, it finds the physical path where the DLL exists. Okay, and this is the uh, threading model in VB6, the uh, apartment threading model is used. Again, we don't going to get into so many details, right? So what important is this? So what uh, when you create an instance of this DLL, what it does is it's going to look up into your Windows registry and then create the, uh, load this DLL into memory. That's how it's going to happen. So if you have the registry entry, two cases, and don't have the DLL in this place, then your instantiation is going to fail. Okay, that's number one case. And also, you have the decopied the DLL here, but you don't have the registry entry. In that case, also, you cannot use the COM component. So, registry is a must and should, and that's what happens. So, down the line, uh, I have seen cases, uh, very horrible cases, when you work with COM, that you need to keep this in mind. Uh, sometimes it also happens that uh, you keep this DLL somewhere else and register it. It will let you do it actually. It will not say that this, uh, this DLL is already registered. It will let you do it. So what happens is you have two different uh, places. You have the same DLL registered in the machine and whichever comes first is going to pick it. And you try to deploy the new DLL to that location, and you don't see that uh, change is getting reflected. So whenever you play with COM components, you need to keep your heart and soul at work and uh, really work with that carefully. Um, so whenever you install a new copy of the DLL, make sure you uninstall the original one and then reinstall uh, install the new one. That's need to be uh, taken care of manually. Okay. 
that's uh, kind of a little trouble uh, when you play with com actually so you need to be very very uh, cautious about uh, where you're putting the dll and uh, is it already installed or not and other things when it comes to com plus uh, again it's it's more visual um, we have seen uh, we have a com plus application loaded and in that case we just have to drag and drop the dll in this case what, I'm, what i can do is uh, Again, of course, I, today we're going to see only this part. Uh, complex also you can do the same way. Only thing is we need to create the complex application and then uh, in place of the DLL location, you just have to drag and drop this DLL. That's how it takes. Otherwise, everything else remains same. Okay, good. So we have installed this DLL successfully. Now what I'm going to do is we're going to test it inside my uh, VB itself. Okay, so how I can go into do it? I, uh, for testing this code inside the uh, the project here, uh, this option is good enough. Uh, wherein it's actually referring to the project inside this uh, uh, group itself, okay, which is good enough for me to test my code. So how I'm going to test my code in the command click, I need to just create an instance of uh, OBJ as a new my math project okay and uh, of course what I need to do is MSG box and uh, say obj dot add does it have add it has added what happened good I think I missed one thing which is a class here so I'm actually creating an instance of the class not the project right so that's the problem dot add I'm going to pass some values like 5 and 2, add 2 of that and give me the result and uh, similarly MSG box so obj dot subtract uh, 5 of 2 and since it's a visual basic there is no semicolon nothing um, it's uh, straight vanilla okay uh, multiply again 5 and 2 so what should happen in this case in the first case it should add 5 to give me 7 and subtract 5 in the second case subtract 5 of 2 it should give me 3 and the last one 5 into 2 right so that's what it should happen oops my startup project it's the same thing so if you see I just have to change my startup project here and then hit this and this is the first case wherein it's a 5 plus 2 7 second place 5 minus 2 and third so my code really works good and I'm done so I'm done with my VB I'm done so I published it I registered it now the next step is to consume it in my um, application okay so I have a form, uh, form already available here which I can make use of it the same way uh, that I have uh, used in this case what I'm going to do is I do the same thing what I did in uh, the test uh, form. So I'm going to take care uh, and get, get rid of that. Uh, Chris, leave this open. Okay, so now, so how to do it? So before I consume it, we did talk about the wrapper, right? So now this is the .NET project and that's a com component. Now to make it happen, it's going to be just like a, adding a reference to that com component. Since I have registered this, I should be able to see in my references this is a special uh, tab if you see we did over, uh, got an overview of the all these tabs and today we'll see the com so once i register it uh, this com tab will actually list out all the components which are registered so i am looking for my component called my uh, my so where is my my yep there you go good so i can able to see uh, my math which I have registered which is available in uh, C temp uh, this path matches because this information it actually picked from the uh, uh, from the registry so all these entries are from the Windows registry so wherein I see my math uh, project also what I need is I just have to add a reference to it what just happened here is it just created it just created a wrapper this is called the runtime callable wrapper this my math project is a runtime callable wrapper and if you take a look at this 
uh, the Visual Studio names it as an interop dot my math project. Okay, this is nothing but an assembly that's added up to your project directly, just like any system or core, any of these DLLs. So this is a dot net uh, component uh, added to your project, and now you can refer to its methods, all the com specific methods. Uh, just like any other uh, assembly uh, that you refer to so which makes it more easy for you to code so in this case when I write my C sharp code what I'm going to do is I'll say my math project so now my math project is available here I'll say opj my math is equal to new my math project so that's how the C sharp syntax go right and obj math dot oops again I'm mistaken uh, since I need to actually create a class right <coughs> okay so the class uh, I need to put the name here as well okay and now obj my math dot add takes the same thing five two but of course I want to <coughs> I want to print this out right so how do I print this out I use the same old CW okay although this is a Windows based application I can still do this either way if you want to make it a rich client uh, with uh, some input uh, text boxes and take it you can still do that uh, of course I'm trying to little uh, decorate this output and resulted uh, in uh, zero right whatever output is okay so good so and uh, let me compile this is there any errors yes looks like there are some lot of errors here let us see what is the problem oops Let's take a look. Oops, uh, I think I already have this connected here, wired it here. Yes, it does work. So I have the 5.7 as resulted to, uh, since it is a console right line, I can see my output here, which is very well good. And in this case, subtract and now multiply. Good. So I have all these three uh, things uh, done and uh, I'll run this code and hit the button and uh, yes I can see the output uh, as a 7, 3, 10 which is correctly calling. So how do I know that it is actually making the call? to my DLL because we don't know what exactly is uh, uh, in this uh, class right is it like uh, this callable wrapper is just a wrapper to the com component or is it a kind of a, a, a converted assembly add up to the dot net uh, so how can you know that it is really uh, make it's just a wrapper that means it, you have it always uh, when at runtime it should be calling the respective com component right instead of uh, if it is a converted assembly uh, just the taking the DLL from component and then convert it into DLL that means you also it also gets the implementation logic also uh, written as an assembly uh, so to verify that we can actually simply 
uninstall this component. To uninstall, we need to just pass the uh, slash u as a switch and then do it. Oops, there is a problem. Oops, that's the problem. It's the same thing. It's, I thought it's going to be a major error, but it's not a major error. It's just my typo. Okay, so it's good. So, uh, uninstallation is uh, successful. How? You can see it is a un DLL unregistry uh, register server is done. In the other case, it was actually picking the DLL register server. If you pay a close attention, you can actually call this directly instead of using a registry authority. Right. You can do that way also. Regasware again have wrapper to other DLLs. So it's going to call the respective DLLs, uh, uh, the EXEs, uh, based on the switch that you provide. Okay, so now the DLL is removed from the assembly, but the file is still there. The file is not gone anywhere. It just uh, unregistered from the registry, which we said, which we have seen in other case. So now. If this is a, just a wrapper that's going to call the com component runtime, then this code should fail, right? Although, oops, I'm still running. I'm trying to compile to make sure if there is any compiled errors. I'm compiling this, and I see a compiled error. Now, what is this compiled error doing here? Okay, what it says. The type or namespace name MyMath could not be found. Are you missing the using directive or an assembly reference? Am I losing? No, I have this reference here. So this is a good thing about the IDE. IDE is since you already have a reference to this, that means this reference, whatever you have created, is actually uh, uh, having a wrapper to the COM component. So you, the reference that you have added here is no more available now. So that's the reason it breaks at the design time itself. Okay, but this is fine. So the, the design time, it's fine. So what happened to the EXE that I have already compiled in the, in the last time, right? What happens if I run that EXE? Because that's already having the same code, a compiled one, and uh, what will happen if I run that code? Let's see that. Okay, so this is the COM component that we were trying to. There you go. So at runtime also, it's actually failed retrieving the COM class factory with the GUID. So this is the GUID that it's actually referring to. And this GUID also goes alongside uh, with the registry. So when you add a reference, this is just a wrapper which has the interface, a public interface methods available uh, that you can consume in the .NET code. But at runtime, it need to be available in that given machine. Suppose you have created this application and distribute this into the higher environment like a development environment or a integration box or a production box. And the box also should have this component available in order for your application to run. So that's the key thing there. So if the component is not available in that server, then it's going to break. And that's what we have seen here. Okay, so it's saying that if I, uh, okay, so now let me compile this. It's good. So compile time is good. Okay, so I'm running uh, in the IDE so that to see the output. So I see the add sub multiply output. So that's how you can actually make it con uh, consume the uh, the com inside a .NET programs. I hope this demo helped you understand it. It's uh, uh, this is the runtime callable wrapper. You can make use of it. Uh, if at all you're going to use the p invoke method, then you will not have the luxury of the wrapper. In which case, uh, you can you have you will have to completely rely on the late time binding, wherein uh, you will have to write the code, uh, uh, but that code will have a late time binding at runtime. So late time binding it refers to the binding to the respective calls uh, at the runtime uh, rather than the design time. So 
uh, the respective classes uh, whichever you are referring to will be loaded uh, when that uh, line of code is visited otherwise it's not going to load at, uh, at the beginning of the application just like adding a reference to it so the advantage of adding a reference to the project indicates that these are the assemblies that are required by the program so which will be loaded at the run at the beginning of the runtime itself okay so that's all i have uh, for today so So in this session, we did walk through the XML validation in using programmatic way uh, within the code uh, using the XSD file and continued with the very detailed topic uh, on the COM. We did see the what is the COM, uh, uh, all the interfaces. It has the address, release, query interface, and what is the rig SVR32 to register and unregister the COM components. Uh, we did see a lot of theory and also walk through the steps to create a, a com, uh, component and host it uh, or consume it in a .NET base application uh, using the RCW, which is uh, runtime callable wrappers. And we did see a very good demo on that area. And uh, with that, we'll wind up this session uh, and we'll continue with the next topics in the next session.